I'm Adam from Multex. We've heard from Sid this morning and we've heard from a lot of other vendors uh, preceding me as well about the advantages of molten salt reactor technology um, around the economic viability of the technology at the moment. I've got the rare pleasure of standing in front of a room full of people who actually probably agree with me in saying that molten salt reactors are a solution. There are many solutions to, to what the world faces at the moment, but a really a practical solution that has gathered a lot of affinity and, and a lot of um, focus around the world. So the question that I'm going to try and answer is not technically why is the Multex stable salt reactor perhaps a better technology or a better variant of a molten salt reactor, but more what's important around what we're trying to do, which is the economics. So for groans of the room, because I know you're sort of more on the technical side, I will be talking more around the economics of the stable salt reactor. This is a brief overview of Multex's technology portfolio. Um, we are the proprietary developers of stable salt reactor technology. And when I've got two minutes to explain stable salt reactor technology, what I say is it's the one where we put our fissile salts into conventional fuel pins. We put those conventional fuel pins into a conventional fuel assembly, and we fuel a conventional nuclear reactor core with a non-fissile coolant in a full reactor. Um, it's very closely related actually to the precursor to the MSRE, which we heard around this morning, which was the aircraft reactor design. Um, one of the, the preconceptual ideas that was actually investigated was to circumvent a lot of the issues around pumping radioactive salts, the techno technological hurdles, I wish to with technological, um, that, that that brings. Um, and that was actually just to have your fuel salt constrained within fuel pins. Um, so we treat it exactly like you would a conventional solid fueled reactor. Uh, that means that today's safeguards um, are practical for our reactor. It means that the current operational uh, processes are um, deployable in one of our reactors. It's much more conventional for what is a contemporary licensing realm, which is someone who's been looking at solid fuel reactors for the last 60 years and trying to come up with regulatory arguments for why they are practical. All of this comes down to the first bit, which is rapid deployment. So the reason we selected to do this, and we, we didn't immediately come up with the idea of having our salt contained within fuel pins, but the fundamental reason, I won't wax lyrical about the technological side, is that it allows us not to avoid all of the technical hurdles associated with deployment of a first of a kind reactor, but the hurdles that remain can be a lot simpler. They can be answered with far more conventional um, non-irradiated testing. And we can get to that level with lower investment, lower development cost for the first of a kind reactor. And the second really key thing which we like to, to talk about is the scale of our power plant. So we're not looking at 100 megawatt classes or, or below. Um, we believe that actually to try and get investment and the economic feasibility that we need around the first reactor is to go with a gigawatt scale. Um, in that sense, it's what utilities use, it's what they're familiar with. Um, you actually um, manage to get out a lot more revenue from a gigawatt size reactor than you would from a smaller reactor. All of your fixed costs, they have to be amortized over what your reactor can actually generate and the, uh, the cost of that energy that comes out. So those two things, rapid deployment, so short development programs and an expedient first of the kind. That means we're not talking about, as Sid was saying this morning, uh, going to the governments around the world, cap in hand, saying, you know, do you fancy doing this? Um, and we're not hoping that we, we run into someone who is incredibly affluent um, down the pub or, or something like that. Uh, to try and sell them on this, this concept. We're trying to make molten salt reactor technology investable in the private industry. So that is someone faced with a decision between building an offshore wind turbine array or a first of a kind Multex stable salt reactor. We'll actually say that is you know, economically practical. I can build it within this time frame. I can get to licensing within this number of years. Um, so it's the debate in, in the number of years, but we, we're fairly confident we can do it in a short time frame, which I'll go on to discuss. Um, and I can get profit back. There's a really good net profit value to my first of a kind. So I'm not going to have to build 10, 15, 20 um, before I become a profitable business. Because um, those, those millions, hundreds of millions and billions that people tie up in development, they are worth something in the in intermediate time. We don't have um, billions around the world which can be tied up for 10 years in development anymore. That's just not the, uh, the situation. Those are the two key things about stable salt reactor, and now I'll accelerate through the rest. We have three variants, so three variants of the fuel cycle, which I'll be talking about here. Um, the SSRW is our first of a kind. Um, that's a chloride salt um, fueled reactor. Uh, it's fueled by spent oxide fuel, and we're looking to do the first of a kind in Canada. Um, and then we have two later designs. 
They are the SSRU, which is a conventional LEU fueled, 5% fueled um, graphite moderated reactor. And eventually, the, the, what will become a retrofit of that or an extension of that is to get to a thorium breeding cycle. So we're not trying to do it first of all. We're trying to break down our technical challenges into slightly more digestible chunks. Um, two other key technologies on the bottom, which make a lot of this possible. Um, grid reserve is one which we conventionally like to talk a lot about, but seeing as it's not fuel cycle related, I'll, I'll gloss over that um, at this point. Um, grid reserve is effectively using CSP technology. So we've heard earlier on around solar salt and the ability to actually store energy. Um, the ability to act as a peaking plant, um, and that is actually effectively use this as a buffer tank during your operation so that you can deploy your energy to grid actually when you need it in, in a modern um, grid mentality. So we believe base load is dead and that it will um, actually become something of a, uh, a, a, um, a non-requirement in the near future. So being able to operate flexibly, being operate with, in terms of a, yeah, a CCGT plant, something like that, is really what we're targeting with grid reserve. Um, give you a worked example of what I mean there, you could build a 300 uh, megawatt electric equivalent plant. Um, you could put in, say, 16, um, uh, five minutes already, I'm on slide two. Uh, <laughs> you can put in um, energy storage and the term, term solar salt, and then you can actually um, deploy to grid, say, a gigawatt electric for a period of eight hours in the day. Um, what is how we convert our spent fuel into, um, sorry, uh, oxide spent fuel from water reactors into our fresh fuel for SSRW? Um, the reason we're just mentioning this here is because we don't actually separate out the plutonium. If you're going to fuel on plutonium, very complex, could take a long time. Don't want to do that for your first one. For us, um, we've got a way around that in the sense that we actually keep it relatively impure with all of our lanthanide contaminants. Um, again, liquid fuel allows you to do that. Uh, the company background I will go through very quickly because this is of probably less interest to you, but um, in the time we have, um, the company started in the UK um, in 2014, around the same time as a lot of other molten salt reactor vendors. And the, the initiator of all of this really was uh, Dr. Ian Scott. And he didn't set out with a particular affinity for even molten salt reactors, to be honest. He started off with a very similar uh, fundamental equation, if I can borrow Trolls' term from earlier on around how quickly we need to be able to deploy um, clean energy around the globe. And this led him back to the original concept of having a static fuel pin filled with, with molten salt as being a, uh, a more expedient route to development. Um, so we are still in the UK. I'm still in the UK. Um, we have Multics Energy Limited in the UK. We also have Multics Energy Canada, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. And we also have Multics Energy USA, which I will talk about a little less. Um, the rest is readable, I think, and, and not much to discuss there. Um, so activities, this is meant to be a talk about what we're doing. So in the UK at the moment, there has been a bit of a shift in the last year. Uh, this summer, there was an announcement in the Advanced Modular Reactor Feasibility Study. Uh, so another new acronym for, uh, for advanced reactors. Um, and this is now to support advanced modular reactors at an early development stage and really to look into their feasibility for the UK supply chain, for uh, the future of the UK energy economy and export market as well. So we're one of eight vendors selected to carry out this feasibility study. So it's ongoing this year. The first phase is effectively the, uh, the data exchange. And then the second phase of this uh, next year will be active R&D, which for the UK is, is sort of a, a pretty progressive step. They've also always been quite conservative in the, uh, the advanced reactor field, unlike uh, our friends in the US and, and Canada. Key one on the bottom, we've been talking about um, technology a lot again. The reality of economics is we need to start talking to regulators. To do that in the UK, the way we do that is through this feasibility study. However, in Canada, for the last year, uh, yes, last year, it, almost, um, we've been engaged in the vendor design review um, with the CNSC, the Canadian regulator. And the purpose of the vendor design review is really to get early engagement feedback on our design. Um, not just around the um, licensing readiness, but also about how able we are to actually gather the technical evidence we will need to get to licensing. So it's all well and good talking about a theoretical test that we have to do at some point in Petten or wherever it might be. But if you know, that facility happens to be full for the next five years and you'll have to wait diligently for your slot behind all the people paying their money, then that all counts against you. That's all part of feasibility and all part of the economics. So if we can avoid that path through development, we shall. Um, so we're currently part way through phase one 
It's a two phase review. Um, there is a third phase. If you get stuck at any point, you can come back. Um, phase one is really the proposal. Phase two is coming back with the evidence. Um, but we intend to finish this within the next 18 months. And that really serves as a basis for the next slide, uh, which is our announcement this year that we've signed an MOU with um, a provincial utility, New Brunswick Power, um, who are on the Atlantic coast, um, if you're not familiar with Canadian geography, um, to own and operate the first of a kind stable salt reactor. And it'll be the 300 megawatt equivalent waste burner. We're rightly ready, very, very excited by this. Um, New Brunswick are providing an initial funding. We're much funding that effectively it's to, uh, to set out our development capabilities <coughs> as best we can in New Brunswick. Um, and to set up our, our supply chain discussions out there as well. So it's um, quite a harmonious relationship in that way, but we're early in the early stages of that right now. So Multix Energy Canada set up this summer, now recruiting and, and building in, in numbers out there rather than in the UK. That's in St. John. And you can see in the map, in the bottom right-hand corner, we've got a, uh, a quick uh, view there of Point Le Pro which is where they're currently operating a CANDU, uh, CANDU 6 reactor. They are looking for a replacement for this in the near future, being the sort of, they'll hate me for saying this, but the little sister to Ontario in terms of Canadian uh, nuclear. Uh, they're, they're, they're able to take a little bit more in terms of innovation, innovative steps, should we say. Um, they want to be seen as the trailblazers out there, and that's why they're looking to, to the advanced reactor <coughs> segment. Um, so it's a research cluster being set up out of there with um, a focus on a first of a kind demonstrator. So that was the, the review of activities. How, how long would you like to spend on this one? One minute on the next, okay. Um, a shame, because this was the interesting bit. Um, <laughs> um, so I was just gonna quickly walk you through the three variants of stable salt reactor that we have. Um, and also try and paint the picture of economically why we're doing this one first, because it's not always that obvious. So the waste burner um, was chosen mainly because of the ability to use chloride salts and our ability to approximate our core to a, what I call a pseudo-solid analogy. Um, that means no new codes development in terms of um, regulatory evidence. It also means a, a far simpler argument about materials, which although I can't talk about here in, in 10 seconds, I would implore you to talk to me over if you really want to know after, uh, after the session. It's a very unconventional design for a nuclear reactor, principally because it's actually scalable in one dimension. The reason we do this is because the first of a kind, to get up and running, to get profitable, the economic viability, we want to be able to move from the smaller reactor to the larger reactor, which is a gigawatt plant, with as few development steps as possible. That means that a, um, a utility or an operator can get a footing with our technology quickly, and they can deploy it with conventional Gen 2 and Gen 3 materials, so we're not looking at uh, any new materials qualification and then they can quickly deploy the rest of their fleet on the back of that. Um, the downside is, as I said at the start, you need fuel reprocessing, but because we're doing it in a way where we don't separate our plutonium, it actually makes things a lot more viable in terms of both proliferation, but also in terms of technology readiness. Um, we're using technology that's been proven before in that sense. So in terms of deployment, the fuel cycle relating back to thorium, it's quickest to market. We're using the current materials and we've got the lowest technological hurdles. Uh, we don't have graphite to, to consider for, at this stage, for instance. Um, and the third one is really the key one. It's getting over that hurdle of commercial advantage and saying that actually the waste stream liabilities, if you add that in as an additional fuel uh, negative cost, effectively, it becomes so tantalizing. You know, it's so profitable, why would you do something different? Clearly, there's a limited market for this. So we're looking at people with tens of tons of refined waste, hundreds of tons of uh, oxide fuel waste to actually be able to, to install waste burning reactors. Now that's this, Mark, please don't feel offended by the, the, uh, the plot there if I haven't noted your country in the right color. It was only meant to be illustrative of the kind of markets where you can find the fuel uh, for the SSRW. So uh, clearly fuel can be moved around. The reason we don't get full coverage on the map leads us to this. So this is the next stage in our evolution. So we're not going there immediately. We're going to the waste burner first. But where we want to get to is a 5% LEU fueled reactor. Um, it's very closely related. People slightly balk when I say that the, the fast epithermal waste burner is very similar to the graphite moderated uh, thermal reactor, but actually it's not too far away in terms of development hurdles. Um, so it kind of piggybacks that. It stands on the shoulders of the one before. Uh, there's a change in the salt fuel uh, composition, uh, which brings greater complexity to materials validation. And of course, we're introducing graphite as a, as a solid fuel absorber. Uh, we're moving slightly higher in terms of temperature also. 
but you can see that we're kind of stiffing our way through the technology. Building on the common platform approach, similar uh, reactors designs, similar reactor installation techniques, the deployment of the SSR really becomes the next uh, it for us. Uh, can, can you let me two more minutes? <laughs> um, highlighted here is just really showing what that does. It accesses parts of the world we couldn't access before, where really it wasn't viable to transport the amount of uh, fresh fuel which we were talking about for a reactor. Um, and the red dots there are really where we've already got LEU infrastructure built up. So we're not looking at the HALU um, fuels, 20% fuels, really because there's, there's no um, current centrifuging technology for that. And having an enrichment uh, technology on our t critical path is something we want to avoid. So uh, sticking with 5% um, is something which we can, we can readily deploy and we get reactors running in the places that need them, but not all of them. So finally, there is the thorium reactor. You can see the theme in the, in the names at the top. Um, we haven't been very inventive on that front. Um, this, as you can see, is a close relative of SSRU. Um, so you'll be building on the SSRU initial fuel loads, for instance, um, to implement this. All we're doing at this stage is changing out our primary coolants for a thorium uh, fertile coolant and moving up in temperature range again. Um, we have an online extraction column, which, exchange, uh, which basically extracts both uraniums and, and protactiniums to some degree and is readily diluted into a, a 2,3-A diluent in that bismuth alloy. Um, in that way, that allows you to run autonomously just as a thorium plant. Um, and what that will allow you to do is build on that first iteration of SSRU. Um, you can really then start to build in the areas of the world where going to thorium, although not maybe an immediate problem in the next 10 years, maybe even 20 years, uh, in terms of our availability. You know, we've got a big bank in Kazakhstan now full of, of uh, 5% U235. It does allow us to eventually get to the places that need it. And are, you know, we're looking back at a map now that's very similar to Trolls's earlier on. We got into this to really solve the fundamental equation problem. And to do that, it takes a mix of all three. That is our, our roadmap to deployment.